we are oh. we are live. So welcome to another episode of What Were You Thinking? And it's official. You're now looking at our one of our new co-hosts, Bobby Grant. Bobby, why don't you introduce yourself, man? Yeah, so if you guys tuned in last week, uh, I, I jumped on with Devin, an old buddy of mine from high school, and then we've, we've stayed really close since that point in time. Uh, but been in track and field now since I was uh, in eighth grade, and then uh, I ran for Texas A&M. As you can see, I have my jersey that I proudly keep behind my uh, little coffee table here and uh, run professionally for Diodora and for the Italian Federation. Um, and uh, just really excited to be able to, to host this every once in a while and jump on with some cool guests. So Bobby, we are, so this is how we roll. Like what time did I text you? <laughs> yeah, you texted me like uh, probably an hour and a half ago. I was on, I was about to get in the car with my puppy, drive to my parents' house for dinner. And I was like, I call my mom, like, ah, I'm not going to make it tonight. I've got something to do. Yeah. Well, you know, you're a gamer. I knew it. And I'm like, yeah. all right, we're in a tight pinch. We are going to have Phyllis Francis on. She said she might be a few minutes late. So that's really exciting. Uh, yeah, I actually trained with Phyllis at A&M for two years. So she came with Coach Anderson while he was coaching at A&M. So I got a good chance to watch her train uh, up close. She's like, she runs like a horse. Like her stride length is so long. It's like the most, one of the most beautiful training people to watch I've ever seen. She's really? just a fantastic runner. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited to, to, you know, hear you guys kind of chat and tell stories. So she was on, on Monday and we had such a great time, uh, you know, it was Jessica Beard and her, and then I kind of jumped in to kind of fill in some gaps on, uh, as we were struggling with a little bit of tech issues and she was so fun. I'm just like, wow, you should just come back on Thursday. So she's hilarious. If she, uh, I don't know if she has room wherever she lives now, but if she could jump up, she's, she's a pretty good dancer. She was always dancing at practice. So she's she's a really interesting character. Well, we're gonna have to bring that out of her <laughs> because she did mention <laughs> dancing, and I'm like, all right, yeah. let's let's let's. Do I it. can't dance, so I won't be able to to partake in that. But I'm sure yeah. we'll let her take the whole thing. Yeah, she can she can take the lead in that one. I don't know, yeah. Bob. You look like you might be able to dance. Hey, mate. Back in the day, back in the day, <laughs> <laughs> a little a little jazz band might be going on. We don't know that that could happen. Yeah, if you've uh, ever seen the movie Hitch, where he's like, this is your sweet spot, that's me. I just stay right there. I don't go out of that zone. That's what dancing is. You need to find yeah. your move and just stick to it. Yep, exactly. That's it. Don't, don't get outside your zone. The uh, So we've had like a, cra a crazy day here. Uh, so we're in Seattle. We've been embedded with, with the Brooks, uh, the Brooks Beasts, their uh, mid-distance running team. Uh, this is, we started with them in Albuquerque, high altitude training. We then traveled with them last week to Portland. Um, super exciting to see them race at, um, Lewis and Clark college. Have you ever been there? I haven't been to the Pacific Northwest uh, uh, only a few times. We had NCAAs in 2016 and 17 at the university of Nike and then, um, university of Oregon, excuse me. And then <laughs> I, uh, and then I, uh, I've been there for, I was there at the Olympic trials in 2016 as well. Um, and then junior trials there in 2014. But other than that, besides just being in Eugene, I've never been to Seattle. I've never been to Portland. So those are two areas I've definitely loved to see. It's a, it's a really cool college. Like it's, it's got this really old wood grandstand. It's like tucked in, you know, these beautiful trees, it, you know, it was, a, it was a nice little crowd they had out there. It was raining and somewhat miserable. But um, the meet was fun. And I feel like distance runners like when it rains, though. That's what it seems like, right? Yeah, they're I feel like there, it's like their sweet spot. They're running the 5K. They're just like, this is great. I love it. Well, if you're running for that long, I feel like being hot and running for that long is just terrible. This is brutal, right? Yeah. The um, Yeah, so now, now we're in Seattle. Uh, and you know then we're headed to eugene you know so we've been this will be an interesting series so we're going to be releasing this uh before the world championships so it'll be super fun to watch but we're also shooting with our friend devin allen and uh we had someone uh we had a shooter out with him in oslo so i don't know did you did you see his race in oslo yet yeah so the 13-2 that he just ran 
I was joking with him because last week we did the podcast together and he ran 1284. So I was like, the people are saying, Devin, that every time we jump on the podcast together, we talk, you're going to run PR. So we were, he was like, oh, I'll call you before this next race. And uh, this is one of, the, one of the only times he really hadn't like reached out to me before his race. And then he ran 13 too. So I texted him right after. I was like, you know, he didn't call me. That's probably what it was. So he's, he, he said, he's like, oh, I'll call you on Saturday because I think he races on Sunday again. Yeah, he's headed to Paris. Um, yeah. And and we'll see what he does there. Hey, you know how it goes though, Bobby. At this at this level, you you get you get the win, right? You no, can... it's all about getting the win at this point, especially in those diamond league races. Sorry, my puppy was trying to chew on my fiddle fig, and so I just threw a cap at her to see if she would get away from it. Um, but yeah, at this level, you've got to be winning races, especially diamond league races against tremendous talent. So that as long as you come out of the race with a win, it's it's always a good deal. Yeah. So. So for, for him, and then I want to talk about you, it, it seems like he really needed to get in a couple of races before USA's, and it really was the only way to do it, right? I mean, jump over there, obviously, you know, make some cash on, on the way. But um, Yeah, he'll feed, he needs to feed Barry. That's a big dog. Uh, the, I'm sure the food with that dog is expensive, so he needed to get to Europe probably around a few races. <laughs> Barry the Great Dane. Barry the Great Dane, I think, is with, with his uncle right now, isn't he? I, usually it's his aunt in Chicago that she goes oh, to the stay aunt in Chicago. Chicago. That's what it is. All right. All right. The, but yeah. Um, yeah. He's, I, I, Devin always, uh, once he starts like cooking, if he gets in a rhythm, it, he tries to stay in that rhythm, I feel like. And so I feel like he was going over to Europe probably to get a few more races in before USA is to kind of stay in that rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be exciting. So we'll be embedded with him as well next week in Eugene. So both, basically all, both of our crews are coming together with the Brooks team, uh, with, with one crew, we'll probably co-mingle a little bit with our productions and then with, with Devin as well. So, um, that'll be super cool. And then we're going to shoot with a bunch of other athletes while we're there as well, and maybe turn around some of that content pretty quickly. We'll see, we'll see how that works. But, yeah, that'll be a fantastic meet. There's a lot of great storylines there. You know, Shakar Richardson's returning to USA champs. Um, and you know, she's, had a tumultuous year i feel like and so now she's coming back this this spring and summer and she's going to come out there i'm sure and try and make a statement and then um i know that uh you know donovan brazier he's looking to come out again since last year he had an injury at the uh, olympics trials so I feel like there's some really good stories that are going to come out of of the the u.s trials this year you're you're giving me the segue because that's what i was just going to ask you i wanted to get your rundown of uh well first of all we should kind of step back Give us a little rundown of where you're at, what you're kind of looking forward to, what kind of timetable you're on. And then let's go back and kind of focus on USA's a little bit and kind of, you know, get, get your lowdown on, on, you know, what we expect yeah. from USA's. Yeah. So my, I'm, I'm uh, nine weeks now post-op where I had two screws put into my navicular bone, which is the bone on the top of your foot, uh, right below your talus. If anybody watching here is familiar with the bones on the foot. Um, it's an injury, you know, Janet Prandini had, a navicular injury, you know, Bryce Deadman, who's a close friend of mine as well. He actually had a navicular injury before he came to A&M. So it's, it's quite common with runners because of the amount of force that goes through the bone. And it's been bugging me for a few years. So I decided to have surgery this year, considering that the next two years are pretty big years, uh, needed to have a good year next year to segue into the Olympic year. So right now we're about, I'd say three weeks out from running, which is really exciting for me because I'm just itching to just jog right now to be honest with you uh but that's where i'm at with my training uh and we've just been going to i work with a great pt in dallas who does a lot of the nfl guys down here i was actually sitting next to table in austin today i didn't even realize it if you're familiar with who that is yeah um, he's like one of my favorite highlight tapes to ever watched on youtube and i was just chopping it up with this guy we were just joking about the finals tonight and then he walks out and he goes you know it's table in austin right and i was like no idea if that was him, but that's super <laughs> cool. I was that's like, that's so super cool. cool. He's a really cool guy. So yeah, that they I work with a lot of NFL guys out here in the area with a lot of my PT. And then hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll be 100% and we'll get an early start to the off season. And then I'll be ready to kick indoor off um, as quickly as possible. So that will be, uh, so when you're saying, you know, kicking things off a little bit early on work. So you'll start your workouts. Maybe, instead of maybe yeah. like early December, you'll start workouts. Like no, I'm going to start in August. No, I'm going to start in August. Oh, okay. Because right. I've got to get, I've since I've had, since I'll be out at this point from running for about three months, uh, 
three and a half months, I'll have to really get back into the swing of things, get my lung capacity back up. So we won't start with like, maybe we'll go three days a week in August and we'll just start getting things back together, running wise, get the lung capacity back up. And then we'll start really sprinting probably in um, more so I would say October, but we'll take August and September to get my legs back underneath me, get my lungs back, and then we'll hit it hard once October starts. But yeah, August starting to just like get into the, the nitty gritty stuff. Very cool. And again, take everyone through, you know, the event you run in kind of your, I'm, I'm, you know, you and I were talking about this the other day on the phone, you know, kind of what you think you can do. Cause I really feel like you're a guy that, that you mentioned it. It's like track, the track and field world has like a very short memory. Um, and I, I don't know. I just feel like you're at, in this position to kind of have this, this breakout for, 2024 Paris, but, um, yeah. So I, I run the 400 hurdles. I ran for Texas A&M. Um, I was an 11 time first team all American at A&M. So I was a part of some really great relays as well as I always was in the 400 hurdle final. Uh, I did fall one year at NCAAs, which was actually kind of funny looking back on it, but I, in 2019 or 2018, I had a, an injury at indoors and we ran if, if anybody remembers the relay with USC, Florida and A&M, where we all ran under, you know, 301, I think Florida ran 3016, we ran 3013 and uh, USC ran three flat something pretty quickly uh, indoors that year. And I split, I have to off the top of my head, I think it was 44-4 on the second leg running against Rye and Grant Holloway. So Rye split 44-1, I split 44-4 and I think Grant split 44-6 and we were all right there with each other uh, on second leg. And I actually had a stress reaction in my foot, which I didn't know about. Um, so I had to take some time off. I had to take the outdoor season off to let that rest. And this is the same bone that's been bugging me this whole wow. time. Um, so I'd take some time to rest it, came back the next year. Didn't want to do surgery because, you know, anytime you go under the knife, you know, that's a scary thing. So I was like, oh, no, I'll just heal it up, whatever, and I'll get back out there. Um, got back out the next year. I only had three months to train actual running. And I was able to run 48 in the hurdles at nationals. And I split 44 one on the relay where we ran 259.05. So I felt like I was really primed to go into the Olympic year. I was really excited going into 2020 and uh, was able to get to the indoor season. I ran 32 eight in the indoor two, uh, 300, which at the time was like number five in the world that year. So I was running as quickly as a lot of the 400 runners, like top in the world for like Steven Gardner and things like that. I have a lot of foot speed as a 400 hurdler. And so I was really excited to let that transition into the outdoor season and finally have a, a real outdoor season since for a while I hadn't been able to have one. And then COVID happened and, you know, everyone was impacted. For me as an unsponsored athlete, it was a little more difficult. So I had moved to Tucson, Arizona to train down there at U of A with George Ann Moline and Sage Watson. And then because of, you know, being unsponsored, I actually decided to come back to, to Texas and I switched coaches middle of the year went to European championships indoors and uh, and then my foot started bugging me again. So actually this was this past year. So had to sit out of the last Olympics as well too. Uh, Even though, you know, I was supposed to be a part of the Italian relay and was going to do great in the hurdles and then come back this year. And I have a great indoor or a great uh, off season, get set up really well. And my foot just was giving me trouble again. So finally my doctor was like, Hey, let's, let's put some pins in there let's put some rebar in this foot so that you can train the way you want to, you can compete the way you want to. So I've had a tumultuous about three years to be totally honest with you. And uh, I haven't really been able to get to the level that I know that I can get to uh, just because of the injury. So I am really excited at this point to, for these next two years to really get out there and run. Dude, it's so exciting. Look, as you start laying all that out and, and hearing both those times and, you know, the competition that were around you at that time. Do you look back though on the last Olympics with how well Italy did and feel like, damn, I could have been in the mix on all that. Yeah. I mean, the, the relay definitely is, I think at the Italian relay specifically the four by 400 meter is we have a lot of really good guys that are really ready. So um, when I went to European indoors, we were missing David Ray And we were missing a couple other guys, but there was a younger team with Brian Lopez um, and Scotty and all a couple of us. And so I think our team for the four by four is really primed to actually, in my opinion, medal 
at the next Olympics, just because those guys were young. They're only 20 years old uh, in this past Olympics, 2021. And so, and then the, to see the four by one win, which was incredible. And then to see Marcel Jacobs win the 100, which was also awesome. And then, you know, our guy win the high jump, Joe Marker Tambiri, that was like, so, that, I mean, we had a lot of great performances. I think that was the first time in a long time Italy had walked away with so many golds. And uh, I, I don't, I was super excited for the, everybody because I got to meet all those guys uh, when I was at the, on the European indoor team in Poland. And so to, to see them all kind of achieve the things that they were telling me they wanted to do at that point, that was really cool. Yeah, that's, that's so exciting. And I think you're right, though, that, that uh, I don't remember the last time Italy won that, that many medals, right, in, in the summer games, right? So, um, it, uh, but, uh, so give, me, give me the lowdown, Bobby, on, um, on what you're thinking uh, for USA's. Like, l- let's do like a rundown, like a quick rundown of, of events. It's so competitive across so many different events, but I, w- I want to hear your opinion on, on what that looks like. Yeah, I, I'm really excited for the 100 meter dash just because my guy, Fred Curley, uh, he's made that transition. We ran together at AM, uh, and I have some fun stories about him, but I think that's going to be a tremendous watch because Christian Coleman's returning back to the track, and he's, a, he's an incredible athlete as well, too. I think his first 50 meters, a lot like Shikari in the, on the women's side, you don't really see that type of burst out of the blocks. I mean, him and Trayvon Bromel really have a similar type of twitch for that first 50. But if you let Fred within stride in the last 20 meters, cause he's so tall, he's going to run you down. Um, and then to see, and I'm going to, I, I'm not sure. Does he compete for the U S the Florida guy? Um, I don't think he does the Florida hundred meter champion. I I don't think so. I don't yeah. Think so. I don't think he does, but to see him in that race would have been fun too. But there, that's going to be a great event. Uh, the women's 100, I think is also going to be awesome. Cause Shikari, you know, she's going to come back out. She's going to want to make a big statement considering I think everything that happened last year, and then the men's 400, you know, Michael Norman looks great. Michael Cherry is coming along this year really well. I, I'm excited to see those two kind of go at it. Uh, and then the men's 800, Donovan hasn't raced this year uh, as much. I haven't seen a little bit of him running. And then I know um, I haven't really seen a lot of guys like dip into the like below 145. I know there was a few guys at NCAAs. But, so that event will be really interesting to see who makes the team. Uh, but overall, I think it's going to be a great rate. I know Craig Angles, I saw he might not be competing um, from an injury or something. So I, I know hmm. we'll uh, definitely miss watching him out there since he's a character. But yeah, I think overall, the USA is, I think the men's and women's 100 and the men's, <clears throat> excuse me, the men's 400 are going to be great races. And the men's 400 hurdles because Kenny Selman retired. So there's a spot right there that that opens up since he was on the Olympic team last year. And I think there's a couple of people mm-hmm. like the LSU, the LSU guy. I know everyone calls him Squirrel, I think. Uh, he, he looks great. So we'll see who tr- grabs that third spot. That's what's so wild about track and field, I, I think. There's – it does, the talent doesn't stop. Like it can – like this is why I think USA's will be so exciting. Like it's all of you guys battling uh, – for all the, these different spots, but then there's a whole new set of young men and women coming out of college that, you know, maybe they're a little worn down from, from such a, such a long season, but um, you know, I, I think there's always surprises that, that come out of the, the collegiate ranks. Well, yeah, you'll see somebody that had an okay NCAA's and they'll come out and they'll just make the team. And it happened. Uh, it's happened a few times where you, you know, you think an athlete, you know, they, you don't think they're going to come out and, and really win it. I think I'm trying to think of a story. Well, I, almost like Raven Rogers when Raven Rogers had that year, she went in mm-hmm. A's, but it was kind of like, eh, we'll see how she does when she gets on the stage. Cause she's only a freshman and she went out there and she still did incredible. So there's always those, there's always a few where they leave NCAAs and they come out and they still run really well. So I want to hear some Fred Curley stories, Bobby. <laughs> What's going on with the dog? What's You're happening? screwing my orthotic. So I was like, I got to make sure she doesn't rip it to shreds. I was just watching her do it. And I was like, I don't want to jump off camera. Fred Curley, uh, this is actually a story from um, from Dream Richards, not mine. But he used to listen to, this is Bella Rose, by the way. She's a menace. Um, <laughs> she's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. She's chewing up everything in my house right now. And I'm trying to, I'm not watching it happen in real time while I can't do anything about it. 
So I'm going to have her sit right here with me. But Fred, Fred used to listen to We Are the Champion every morning, according to Dream Richards, before a meet. And he would sing I Am the Champion, um, which is so funny. because, And I've told him this before. <laughs> there's only two people that I would put like all the money in the world that I have on a bet to say like these two people are going to win. And it's Devin and Fred. Because Fred believes in himself more than I think you could ever believe in anything. He has, And I think that's why he's been so successful is because he is able to believe in himself so much to where he knows when he walks out there, he, he, he thinks no matter what, he's going to win. And I think that's what makes him such a great athlete. Um, but he would do stuff in practice. I remember there was a practice. We were supposed to run a 450. And so it was me and Braylon Taplin and Fred in the groups. Coach Henry put the three of us together. And he was like, Bobby, I want you to come through the 400 at 45. Braylon, I want you to come through the, the 400 at 44 high. And Fred, just, we don't know, just run. Because he was so, that was the year that he ran 43.7, where he was, just a, he was just going freaky that year. And he, he came through the, the 400 at 44 flat. And he, he sprinted the last 50 meters of the 450 after coming through the 400 at 44 flat. And I'm chugging along behind him, just like trying to just, grab the fabric on the back of his shirt to pull me to the 450. And I remember being like, wow, he's going to do something just stupid this year. And because this was earlier in the year, and then he ended up running 43, seven. So, I mean, he, he's a, he's a fun, he was fun to train with. He's fun to hang out with just because he's always laughing. always very positive at practice. Um, there's another funny story about Fred and I. So our first year at A&M, we go to SEC's. And we had a pretty bad meet, the both of us. And so Coach Henry, when we're getting off the bus at the end of the track meet, he goes, everybody off the bus, but Fred and Bobby and Eric. And so I'm like, oh, God, I just transferred here from Miami. Like, I'm trying to do the right stuff. And um, he goes, if you guys don't figure it out, I'll replace you. Because we had a bad meet. He's like, this is A&M. Like, we you know, if you don't figure out this year, like there's going to be guys that are going to come in and they'll be on the relay and they'll be around the 400. It's like, you guys got to figure it out. And Fred and I laugh about that to this day because it's like Fred turned out to be the collegiate record holder. I went on to win a couple, uh, a couple of relays with them. And then I was an 11th time all American. And so it's always funny to look back on that when we were kids and just be like, coach Henry just said straight up to us, like, Hey, figure <laughs> it out. Cause this is A&M. Like I can get another people, a couple of people in here to, to get after it and you guys won't be on the relay anymore. So if he was, do you think he was serious or is he just like, Oh no, he was, I mean, cause we had, a terrible, me. we had a terrible me. I think that we both split at like very slow on the relay. I was coming off an injury and Fred had just transferred from South Plains and uh, I'll have to have Fred come on and back the story up. But he was like, yeah, I will. I, you guys better figure it out because I will find new people. And we were like, all right, like, and that, but that's just how AM is, especially with the 400 group. You gotta, you gotta get after it because that relay, like, it's very competitive. There's probably, you know, eight or nine guys that could be on the relay. So you have to take the advantage to when you have your chance. Otherwise, they'll throw somebody else on there. <laughs> it's that is awesome. It's, but you guys are relentless with, with the athletes when you're like, oh, he's AM, she's AM. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, we had, we, we had a, there was a good stretch of, of time where it was actually, it was so interesting to be in, in that space because you had Braylon Taplin, Demetrius Pinder, Shamir Little, Fred Curley, Donna Brazier. Um, let me think who else, uh, Aaliyah Brown, who was on the Olympic hundred meter, uh, four by one. And then we had Phyllis Francis was there at the same time. Dion Lindor was out there, uh, and, and we had a few other uh, Caribbean guys out there too. I can't remember off the top of my head. And it was like just a, such a fun group to be in. But I look back on that time, and I'm like, the amount of talent that we had just walking around at practice every day. Yeah. Like, the practices were crazy. That's unbelievable, right? But yeah, so it's like, you know, you go to A&M, especially if you're in the 400 group. Coach Henry always has one of the top 400 groups every year and four by fours. And so you go to AM to be on the relay. That's a big part about, you know, and I was a big team guy, so I wanted to be on the relay. And, you know, when coach says that to you, coach says, Hey, you know, I will find, and he, he's not kidding. Cause he's going to have a class that comes in the next year of kids that are going to be, he's going to get them to run 45, 44. So you got to figure it out. And that's just kind of his way of saying like, 
all right, you got one. This was your meet where you, this was your SECs where you struggled, but we cannot have this again. And it worked because, you know, look at, you look at the rest of the, what happened and Fred and I both figured it out and we had good careers, but he's a great motivator. You know, he just, he never gets angry. Coach Henry, I you know I see other coaches from other schools are like, sometimes they'll curse or they get really like loud and angry. Coach Henry just look you right in the eyes and he'll just go like this. That's it. I won't say a word. He'll just shake his head and just keep, and just keep walking. And then you know, you're like, dang. And it's almost worse. He doesn't say anything. Cause you're like, man, I really messed up. And so he's, he's, he's a sneaky mental, like, like he's like a mental warrior. He's, he sneakily knows how to get, get people to, to run fast just mentally. How much do you think it's um, like culture that he's built? And then, I mean, obviously without the talent, like you have to start with a level of talent that he's recruiting in. Right. But yeah. how much, how much is that though? Like, okay. And Emma is known for this. So certain athletes that are, you know, talented on a super high level are going to be interested. And then how much is it him and his coaching staff kind of elevating your game? I work specifically with coach Henry. He was my coach for the four years that I was there. And I have a really close relationship with him. I'm really close to his family. His, his uh, nephew is now the assistant coach there, Kurt. I'm, I'm extremely close with him. A lot of people don't know the year that Fred ran 43-7. Kurt was one of the, the main contributors to helping him get to that point. Mm -hmm. So I was really excited to see him um, get hired to join that staff. Coach Henry is a phenomenal coach, but he, the culture that A&M has, it's a specific culture. So you have to be ready to be in that culture. You're not going to get babied. You're not, they're not going to hold your hand. You know, it is a t it is a program that historically has won, and Coach Henry wants to win. So when you come in, you're expected to do things the right way. You're expected to be at practice on time, and he doesn't really deal with like bad actors, if that makes sense. So if you're missing practice or if you're not doing the right things, you just won't travel. And you just won't compete. There's enough. There's enough kids on the team that he can give opportunities to, um, and he doesn't mind giving an opportunity to a walk on over an athlete that is on scholarship because if they deserve it you know and he'll always say he leaves three minutes before the time sheet so he'll leave you there's times where he's left athletes at the track because they were they weren't on they were if you're not five minutes early with him you're late and because he's built that culture where it's like be a grown-up you're here you're a grown-up now it's time to get in it's almost like a professional atmosphere i think that's why he's been so successful with his athletes and then his training a lot of people would try and figure out his training system. And I was there for four years and I honestly couldn't tell you, you know, what, if there's a science behind it, he just has figured out how to get the human body to run the 400 extremely fast because each year the training is different. It's not the same. Really? So he builds it. Yeah. He builds it around this type of athletes that he has um, at the time. And it's a lot of it is similar, but it's never like, it's not like each year you're like, Oh, we did this workout last year. We're doing it again. It's not like that there was a year where we were running two fifties in October and spikes. And then there was a year where we didn't even put spikes on until the, like before the week before the first indoor meet wow. uh, in, in January. So, you know, he kind of just goes with the athletes that are there and he tailors it specifically to the group. So he wants the weakest athlete on the team to be able to get the workouts done as long as, as well as the strongest athlete. So he builds it for the whole group, which is really special because you're you're really getting the most out of everybody and i think that's why you see people's times drop in the 400 there because you could be a walk-on athlete and because he writes it for the entirety of the group that he has you'll see your times improve because he's not going to write it for like it when fred was there he didn't write it specifically for fred he wrote it specifically for the group but i i he's a special coach but he is a definitely a uh, an acquired taste so you're not yeah. if you're an athlete that likes to have your hand held and you like to be you know, really, really close with your coach. Coach Henry is not going to be that guy that's going to like give you a hug after the race and all that. Like he, he's the, he has done it so many times. You walk in his office, he's got a thousand NCAA championship trophies <laughs> behind him. So you have to really step out and figure it out on your own. And, and he creates a culture to where you can, but it's a special place. I thrived in that environment because I don't need, I, I wanted to win so bad. I didn't need anybody to like walk me around and hold my hand and stuff. 
I really just needed the guidance, like show me where to go and let me off my leash. And that's what coach Henry did. He just guided me to, to success. And I love the guy. I think he's a great coach, but he's not for everybody. Just like not every coach is for everybody. Right. Right. So Bobby, I'm thinking as you're telling some of these stories and all like with everything that you've been through to still, um, want to compete at a high level and attain things that you haven't yet attained. How much do you love this sport? I would say I love the sport more than anything. Um, maybe besides my dog. Uh, I, uh, I think that the thing about track that people don't realize is that it doesn't love you back. And I think the sooner that you realize that the better you'll be off in your high school college and professional career you have to love the sport for what it is because it's not going to you're going to have injuries it's a tough sport to navigate professionally it's a tough sport to navigate collegiately uh you got to learn to love the little things about track which i do i love the workouts i love competing and i love training and i think that's because you know kobe bryant he talked about what is the dream and he was like yeah the championships are cool the banners that we hung up are cool but the dream is getting to wake up every day and putting my shoes on and going to practice and working hard and doing the little things. So I think once you realize that the dream is not winning a gold medal, that's obviously a dream, but the dream is to be able to do it as long as possible and at a high level and to where you love it. And I, I always said the second that I, I don't love it, I won't do it anymore. If I didn't love this sport, there's no way I'd still be running after all the injuries and stuff that I've had and the, the stuff I've been through. But I really do love it. I love waking up and I love running. I love competing. Uh, I really love the people that I get to meet. Like I didn't get to know you, Bob, until last week. And we had a phone conversation for about an hour uh, last week. And you told me so many interesting things about your life that I just love learning about. But I never would have met you if I wasn't in track and field. And so that's another yeah. part that I love about the sport is the people that you get to meet. But yeah, I, I don't think it, I'd do it if I didn't love it. It's, yeah, I mean... And what comes through, I mean, and there are so many interesting people like we spent this morning uh, at Coach Danny Mackey's house. Um, and, you know, it's just he's such a fascinating. Do you know Danny at all? Have you gotten to know him? I don't know. Really fascinating guy. Um, and, you know, just super um, calculating and analytical and at the same time like kind of zen he's you know he, he's trained in jujitsu and so you know he's doing that in the evenings he's probably there right now i think his session's at six o'clock so uh pacific time so it there's just so many interesting people you know we spent the afternoon with um drew windle and henry Wynn and isaiah harris and um and even just kind of sitting around talking um I, I, it really struck me too about what you're saying like um track doesn't love you back and it and i think what you're saying is it is what it is your time yeah. is what it is you getting out of the blocks not fast enough because you you know you need to be you know at x point you know 20 meters down the track is on you it's not on anyone else right i mean the whole thing is on you, right? So to me, there's no one to blame. There, everyone has the same conditions. Um, it's it's kind of fascinating to me. So that really strikes uh, a chord with me when you say that, you know. Yeah, Coach Anderson is actually, if you know Vince Anderson, he was on staff at AM while I was there. Super integral part of my success. I love that guy to death. That if you ever want to see a human being just like go on a rant and you sit there and you can really like just enjoy listening to it because they're the way they talk is just so passionate. That's your guy. He who talks about track and field, he compares it to boxing and he would give a speech every year about how courage is not stepping up. Like there is no the, courage is not like beating fear. He's like, you're going to be scared. Courage is the, the triumph over fear in stressful situations. So he'd always say like, you're going to go out there. I I'm scared watching you. You should be scared when you run, you should be afraid, but you have to be courageous. You have to go out there and you're in the amount of courage you have will, will triumph over fear. And he's just an awesome guy to, to talk to. But yeah, he's a guy like that where he explains that, you know, track 
is a sport that you could pour everything into, which I, I mean, I, a good example is that year where we broke the world record. I'd run 45, eight in the open 400 indoors. I'm a 400 hurdler. So that's like, that's pretty quick, especially for indoors. Uh, and I was excited to jump outdoors and have a great race uh, in the 400 hurdles. And then boom, I, I wasn't able to run because I had an injury. And so you put all this work in, I was going to bed on time. I was eating right. I was saying, I was saying prayers every night. I was doing uh, meditation, like everything. I was like, I did everything right. And I still got hurt. Like I didn't go out. I didn't do, I didn't eat bad. And I still got mm -hmm. hurt. And so you sit there and you have to kind of sit back and be like, you know what? That's just sports. You have to be like a goldfish. You just can't remember. You have to just forget. You have to be like, all right, moving on to the next thing. And cause track just, you know, it's a, it, it is what it is. You know, you're going to have injuries. You're going to have races that aren't great. And it, you, it's not going to love you. Like you love it. Like you, you might not have a fairy tale, you know, ending to your season that you think you might have. So you have to just be ready to just take everything the way that it is. Yeah. It's, it's super addictive. I mean, I, I think I mentioned, I, I was not a track person. The first time I ever saw a track event, the first time I'd ever seen any track meet, was 2018 drake relays <laughs> and i'm not a young man like i never saw anything in high school i never competed track and field i didn't i knew nothing about it and when i first saw in the first event that i saw was Devin running in that i think it was literally the first race and i'm like oh my gosh this is crazy this is so intense and the, and the hurdles i just felt like wow this is kind of like this hard violent sport it's super noisy with them, you know, so many guys and hit hurdles. hurdles. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I couldn't believe how noisy it was. And I'm like, this is so intense, you know, and then I've gotten addicted. You know? It's, it's an, I, I, so our sport is marketed wrong. In my personal opinion, I don't think that it's marketed correctly. If I, if I had a glass ball and I was in charge of the way that this sport was marketed, I would add gambling into track and field because I think that that's one thing that track is missing in my personal opinion. And Craig angles, actually, um, if you ever listen to the podcast, pardon my take their uh, sports podcast as well. He yeah. actually went on, I was in Italy and I listened to it every Monday, Wednesday and Friday in the mornings and I'm listening to it. And they're like, and now we have Craig angles on. And I was like, what? So I, I sent a message. I'm like, dude, I didn't, that's so cool. It's my favorite podcast. Um, but he talked about it on the podcast that, you know, adding, cause they're, they are bar stools, a gambling company with Penn national gaming. Yeah. And so they asked him, like, what would it be like if we added gambling to, like, if you guys added gambling to track and field? And Craig was like, yes, that would be huge. Because if you think about it, when you go to a horse race, they have everything laid out. Like, this horse finishes well. I don't know if you've ever been, Bob, but yeah. it, it's, yeah, I used to go with my dad when I was younger. And you sit down and you read about the horses. It's like, this horse has a great finish. This horse has a great start. This horse has five wins this season under their belt. They're hot right now. And you can see the odds like this person, because of the way they've been racing, you know, they're three to one. This person has a great finish and they haven't had a great year so far. So they're 10 to one, but they're a dark horse. They might be able to pull it out. And so it, it makes it fun because you sit there in between races and you really dig in and you learn about these horses actually, and you'll probably never see them again, but that's what our sport is missing. Right. Like the personal touch. Cause when you go out there and if you're just a normal fan and you sit down and it's your first track meet, you're going to be like, wow, Shakar Richardson is so fast. Wow. Um, I'm just spacing on everyone's name right now. There's a Gabby Thomas. She's so fast. You know, Fred Curley. Wow. He's incredible. Michael Norman, Rye Benjamin. But there's other athletes in the field that are tremendous, but you won't get to know much about them because they're not in front. But if you added that aspect of gambling to the sport and you have, you know, little bios on each person, you'll actually get to read a little bit about them and it creates a more personal touch, but it also makes it more of a, a spectator sport because right now tracks not a spectator sport so you just if you watch it yeah. if you love it but you don't watch it if you like for like if when they run the 10k it's tough to sit there the whole time and watch it but if you really knew how those athletes train like if you're a purist you're like wow this is amazing but if you're uh yeah. just a off the street observer you're like ah that's a long race but if you add something yeah. like gambling to it it changes it to where you're like Oh my God, I've got this guy and I, oh, they're three laps in. I need him to move up. And, and it just adds more of an excitement, I think. And I, I think personally, that's what's missing. I think you're 100% right. Yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon, so Brooks sponsored a, um, they sponsor some track meet every year. It's like the best high school athletes. Uh, I think it's more of like 
Well, actually, it was hurdlers. It was everyone. So it was a, it's a, a lot PR. of – it's the Brooks PR. Yeah. Yeah. So I had never been to it. We were there. We were shooting with the team. Um, but we're, we're in the infield shooting, and Drew Wendell says – do you know Drew, by the way? I know the name. I've never met him. He's great. He's a great guy. He's like, okay, so here's what we're going to do. And it was – I think it was the mile maybe. And he's like, here's what we're going to do. Um, you have to pick your athlete at the 300, uh, the 300 meter mark. So basically, we, and that's where we were sitting. So, okay. and we're like, what is it? And he goes, and here's the system. And he created some point system. And so, so we all, you know, we're all watching now as they're starting, as they're going down the back stretch, and we're like going, okay, who am I going to pick? <laughs> right. So it's like, I'm picking number one. So, you know, so you're, you're, you're yeah. all picking numbers. And so by the time we come come past 300, before you know it, we're like screaming for these athletes because we're all, you know, putting in a dollar. Yeah. We did it. We didn't put money in. Don't come after me, NCAA. We didn't put money in when we would watch track races uh, in college, but we would do that, you know, when the longer races would come up, like the steeplechase and the 10K. We would always joke and be like, all right, pick a person. And you'd get into it because you'd see them like moving up and you'd be like, oh my God, come on, come on, come on, come on. And it makes yeah. it more fun. And then you you start researching athletes because we would do it at most track meets where we'd be like, because I had a few of my friends, you know, that actually live in Dallas me now. Um, They weren't necessarily the greatest athletes, but they were, they would travel a lot. And so we would just, they were, I loved being with them because they were so much fun and they made the track meets fun. And the reason why is because we, you know, we'd be at Arizona state for spring break and we'd be watching a longer race and we would sit there and be like, all right, you pick your person. And so as the years went on, we would like be researching before the race and we'd be like, all right, who am I going to pick? And so we would pick numbers out of a hat and then you'd have to go in order. And I'd be like, all right, that's my, that's my guy today. Or that's my girl today that I'm picking to win this race. And it made it fun. And it, I think that that's something that if you added that into track and field, I think you'd see a whole new group of fans that would come in and be supportive. And there, everyone, when I bring that up, they always say to me like, well, what if people throw the race and I think that with any sport there, I mean, it's just like athletes that take steroids. They are athletes that will do things. You know, you look at baseball in the eighties, there were athletes that took steroids so that they could hit right. more home runs. And, you know, you look at most sports, there are athletes that will cheat. It's just inevitable. There are moral, there are moral issues with some athletes in every sport. And so you will have a couple of bad apples probably but it's not going to be the definition of the whole sport, you know, because no, even well, now, you know, yeah, the same thing people. applies to every other, every other sport. Yeah. yeah. And that's really the only argument that anyone that I brought that up to has me, well, what if an, what if Christian Coleman throws a race? I'm like, well, first of all, I know Christian, he's a dog and he's never going to throw a race. Right. Um, but you know, let's say you do have an athlete, there will be like, there's bands. It's the same thing. If you catch an athlete taking drugs, like they're banned for a few years, it's the same type of scenario. You know, you throw a race, you're, you're not allowed to race for a while. And so I think that, you know, and you look at, why am I forgetting the baseball player's name that was betting on games? Now he's not allowed in the Hall of Fame. Pete Rose. Yeah. Pete Rose. Look at Pete Rose. Pete Rose never allowed in the Hall of Fame because of what he did. So there are consequences for actions for everything. But I think that would add a, a bit to the sport where it would make it, especially because, you know, when I did my master's degree, it was in sports management. And I had to write a paper on where I think the trajectory of the global sports is like, what is going to oh, be the next big the next big bubble in sports. Cause if you think about bubbles and athletics, the first one was the TV bubble, you know, when, when football and started going on cable television, that was a big right. bubble. So now you have people putting sponsors on TV and there's commercials and things like that. And then the next big bubble was the different types of networks that were paying, you know, you have like ESPN paying for games, CBS. And so that was the next big bubble. And there hasn't really been a, another bubble of, financial investment into sports since then that's been like the gold standard is if you can get an, an NBC to to buy the rights of something or an ABC etc but with sports gambling you see like you know the the Arizona Diamondbacks are sponsored by FanDuel right. and the Phoenix Suns are I think as well sponsored by FanDuel and you can go in there and there's specific bets that the sports book puts out specifically just for the Suns and the Diamondbacks etc so you see there's an influx of of gambling now, you know, you used to go on ESPN and they would never talk about gambling because right. it was like almost a cardinal sin in sports. To talk about it. Now you can see the sports lines on the bottom of the screen. 
uh, NFL too. Like you, you, they were yeah. so against it. Now NFL network has a whole segment on right. what, who to bet on. So <laughs> I think it's the next big bubble in athletics. And I think track would be smart to try to try and not, you can't just like go all out and make every, every game or every track meet uh, a betting meet, but start inter- you know, integrating in a few couple of meets and see what happens. And I think you'll see that there's some more viewers that'll jump in. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're totally right. Totally right. The um, so I haven't heard back from. I, there must be some issue going on uh, with Phyllis. She must be. Uh, she'll have to come on another show. But um, so normally, Bobby, we do near the end of the show. We do this. What were you thinking? Uh, mm-hmm. Type of question. So I'm gonna let you think about it because you know you need practice as as the new co-host. Okay. Yeah, so you you have to do a what were you thinking question to me, and then, but I have one for you. So um, you told this really great story about Devin in football, and the time that you lined yeah. you lined up yeah. again. I want you to retell this story because I thought that was the funniest story and the best part was devin's like no i don't think that happened I don't he's such a liar he's <laughs> such a liar so for those people that didn't tune in last week devin allen and i who's the host a lot of times on this show we were high school teammates we went to high school together we've been really good friends um since i was a freshman and he was a sophomore he's a year older than me we've stayed extremely close since high school we played football together i played running back and linebacker for the first two years i got pulled up to varsity after my freshman year mostly probably because i was really fast and they wanted to see what i could do but we they thought that i was too small to play running back which i don't want to get into that i don't think i was so they wanted no, because they're like that was crazy yeah. made that decision yeah i don't know but they oh. they threw me at cornerback because they're like oh he's fast he could probably play cornerback but i can't run backwards like i just can't i'm not great at running backwards at backpedaling so i struggled at the position when they first moved me up. So I'm a freshman on varsity and I had just gotten up after the freshman season and Devin. Oh, if let's you're pause, Arizona, pause the story for one second. Yeah. Cause my, my, what were you thinking question? Okay. It's going to be, what were you, what were you thinking when kind of the punchline of the story, like, and then I'll let you continue. What were you thinking when kind of the real punchline of the story happened? That's what I, that will be my question. Now tell the if rest I of the If I could story. say what I actually was thinking, I, I don't think I'd be allowed on the podcast again, <laughs> but I was, I was pissed. I was like, I can So tell the rest of the story so everybody knows what it is. And then let's go back to that moment. Okay. So I was a little freshman and I'm only, I'm only 15 years old. I'm on varsity. And you know, when you, when you get pulled up, like I'm a confident guy, but if you're from Arizona, you know who Devin Allen is. Devin Allen was a tremendous track athlete, like a youth track athlete. He was extreme, he was running 10 seconds when he was, I think, like 11 or 12 years old. Like, he was very fast. So everybody knew who he was, especially me, you know, going into Brophy. So, and I got really close to him my first year there. We spent a lot of time together. And when I got pulled up, he was, like, taking me under his wing, showing me everything. And I, they were like, all right, Bobby, go guard Devin because Devin's fast. They're like, Bobby's fast. Devin's fast. Well, let's see what happens. So they they throw me out there, and as we're like jogging out, because Devin was a was an outside receiver, as we're jogging out, I kind of say to him like, "Hey, like, what are you running? I'm not going to do anything. I just want to know." Um, I was like, "I'm kind of nervous." Like I told him, "I'm kind of nervous," and me thinking that Devin was like gonna throw me a bone was a bad idea. But Devin Devin was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. dude, shoot, just shoot the gap, shoot the gap." And I'm like, "Okay." Which essentially for me was like, all right, he's probably going to do some type of in route or he's going to be running a shorter route so I can make a break on it. And so in my head, I'm like, I'm not going to break hard because I don't want to like he gave he threw me a bone here. I'm be nice, obviously. So Devin runs. He gets about six or seven yards in and he like plants and I see his hips move. So I break hard and I run downhill. And because I think he's turning around, I'm not in any any mindset to turn around. So then he, because he's a great athlete, he flips his hips back around and then takes off off, off field. So he ran a stop and go. And I just, he just blew by me. And there was nothing I could do. I just kind of stood there and just watched as, you know, Tyler Brugman, our quarterback, just threw the ball to him. And he runs back and he's got a big old, you know, grin on his face and he's laughing. And he's, he said, he was like, yeah, you just had something like, oh yeah, it's how you kiss the baby or whatever. And then he ran back to the, Ran back to the huddle and I was so pissed. I was like, I can't believe that he did. So we were after practice. I had like, 
I walked up to him, I'm like, dude, what the hell was that? And he's just laughing. <laughs> he'll, he'll tell you to this day, he never told me to shoot the gap. He never said that to me, but he definitely did. I'll, I'll never forget that. So now it's our joke. Like before I have a big race, Devin will text me. I'll be like, hey, shoot the gap. <laughs> but that's, that's the story behind that. And I'll, yeah, you know, I'm still, I, you know, when I go to therapy, I'm like, you know, we'll, we're going to hold off on mom today. We have to talk about Devin shooting the gap. <laughs> So, so what were you thinking in the moment? It, was, that, it really is, I guess. What are you thinking now? Because it's kind of a, it kind of seems like that's Devin in, in a little much. Yeah, He's no, it's so for sure. competitive. There's no way he was going to throw you a bone. You no, yeah, you, that he's. When I play Call of Duty with Devin, I think if we were in the same room, he would kill me. Because <laughs> if we, if I like get him killed or something like that, and I'll play with my other friends that don't know Devin super well from high school. He'll just be screaming, like Bobby, like screaming at me in the headphones, and then he's like, "I'm getting off," and he gets off. My friends are like, "Man, he hates you," and I'm like, "No, nah, he's just, he's just, he's." And then he'll always text me after and be like, "Hey, man, my bad. Like, I just really wanted to win." And I always laugh. I'm like, "It's fine, dude. Like, we're good." But yeah, like in that moment, I was like, I was upset. I was like, "Man, this is my this is one of my my best friends," and he just like totally threw me out there to dry. But now now it's funny like i think it's hilarious we joke about it a lot and <laughs> it's become a story that he likes to tell and uh, that story that i like to tell and so i don't know it turned out to be a good thing but in the moment i was like that sucks <laughs> <laughs> that's super funny <laughs> yeah i guess the what were you thinking for you i just only met you a week ago so this, this is, is the first time ever this this has happened reversing the what were you yeah. thinking yeah you I told me a story about the the platform that you developed um with i think you said a million data points yep. and it, it's it's a tremendous platform and you developed it early 2000s i think you said and you told me a story about how partially what you built was used for an election with a state with a, a president and how his slogan was uh almost built off of the data points that you put together so what were you thinking when you saw that your work put a president in office? That's a really good question. The, um, I, I, I felt like what I was doing was actually, you know, pretty worthwhile. Like it was interesting cause I, so I invented this tool by accident, right? So it's this research tool that we use to help direct, uh, you know, I always say guide, focus and inspire our content. But I had I'd used it in the past to consult in TV shows and, and, you know, like The Office and Shark Tank and all these shows. But I did use it in the, in the 2008 presidential election. And um, originally uh, working for this guy, uh, Harold Dickies, who, um, who was you know, doing work for uh, Hillary Clinton. But when she lost to Obama, then I kind of asked him if we could turn over that, that, that data to the, to the Obama team. And um, I knew I had written, I knew that it was a really interesting report. I knew that the data was really insightful. Um, and it was just super exciting to see like, wow, like this little, you know, cause again, like I told you, I don't, I'm not a research person. I didn't come out of the analytics world. This was like an accident when I invented this thing in 2003. Um, so to then have an impact like that, um, was pretty, I don't know, pretty humbling and astonishing, frankly. It was, and still when I tell these stories, like um, people are like, oh my God, it's crazy. I don't really think of it like that, that it's so um, crazy because it was just, the knowledge was just so clear to me. Yeah. So um, I didn't, I didn't think it was, uh, but I think differently. And so, and, yeah. and so I build studies differently. Therefore, different conclusions happen. But um, yeah, no, that was. Uh, well, they, they always say that the greatest minds are not, you know, because you in the United States, we have this education system where it's so like this, you have to be, you have to do this, 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 and this, and you're measured based off of very set criteria, but not, not always is the, like, everyone thinks you have to be able to put the square peg in the square hole. And that is a measure of intelligence. You know, when you're in kindergarten, like that's the measure if they can put the block. But a lot of times thinking differently is 
something that I think we should foster as a society. So it's really cool to see that, you know, you think outside the box, you think differently. And for those people that, um, cause he let me in on this insight, but the, the slogan hope that Obama used in his campaign that came from some of Bob's research. And so I think that that's such a cool story because, you know, you put in the work, you put in the, the time and the effort and you thought outside the box and it really impacted the, our country for sure, because he became president. Um, so you, you made an impact on millions and millions of people just from writing a report. Yeah. 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 It's, but sometimes uh, you don't think of it like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It is true. And the, you know, I'm, you know, a lot of what we're doing, I'm super excited. I'm, you know, about applying all of that knowledge. Yeah. We have a million data points in this one study, which is all about what I'm excited about with you guys is I know that you guys are looking for these little edges, you know, it's, you're looking to shave. I mean, look at Devin, 12, eight, four. Right. And like you said the other day, if he, if he didn't, <laughs> he didn't run through the line. I don't care what anybody he says. He didn't run through the line. You're totally yeah. right. I said the same thing when I saw it, but think about that little, little tiny edge. And Devin always talks about, you know, this idea of getting, you know, 1% better and, you know, but uh, that's what we're trying to do with, with this research, really, to understand and analyze, like, in the content world, how people are connecting, what people want to see, um, and then turn it over to our creative side to then kind of, you know, let the magic happen from there. So it's not like spitting out all the answers. Yeah. But it's getting us, I've literally quantified it and all the work I've done for all these years on it, you're about... 70%, 70, if I were to get like precise, you're about 72% of the way there when you run stuff through our research stuff. And then okay. from there on forward, it's, it's how you do it, how you execute it, how you're executing the marketing side of it, social marketing, whatever. But um, yeah, I'd, you know, like anything, wouldn't we all like to stand closer to, to the finish line, right? That's the whole goal. Yeah. Yeah, you brought up Devin talking about that. And I'll, this is a quick story just to end the show because I know we're coming up on time. But Devin used to do two more of everything in the weight room. So when I first got to school with him, we'd go down to the weight room for football. And if we had to do you know 20 push-ups, Devin would do. And I don't know if he'll remember this, but I do because it had such an impact on me. He'd do 22. Or he yeah. would do, if we had to do sit-ups, he would do 22. Stuff like that. If we were doing cleans, he'd do two more. And I would always ask him, like, why are you doing that? He'd be like, so I'm two times better than everybody else. Um, and so I don't know if he'll remember that. I definitely remember it for sure. Because, you know, uh, being younger than him and kind of seeing that, I was like, wow, that's interesting. Um, but, yeah, that's the type of athlete that he is. And I was fortunate enough to, like, just follow along and then pick all that up from him. But yeah, you know, the little things do really matter. Like, those small those small things matter. Yeah, I, I think, and, and you're right, we've got to wrap it up here. I do think, though, that that, this is one of the things I've learned because I'm, I'm a bit of a sponge myself. So I'm, I feel like I'm on this journey as we're all creating content, um, featuring you guys. I'm, I'm a sponge of, you know, how do you get better, right? What, what can we learn from you guys, right, to make us better at our jobs? And it is, it really is. It's the little things. It's the little things. And, and you guys all hit the same thing too on when I asked the, what it takes to be the greatest and. And, uh, you know, discipline is always one of those that's at the top of the list that'll, that'll kind of, you can have all the passion, you can have all the energy and all the talent, but if you don't apply it consistently with, you know, with that discipline, is that not going to actually get done? Yeah. Jocko Willink, Navy, former Navy SEAL, he says that motivation will lag with discipline is forever. So there's days where you're going to wake up and you'll be like, I don't want to do this, but if you're disciplined, you'll go. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a, that's something that takes time. I think that for the younger athletes that are watching this, it's not going to happen right away. Like so there's some people that are born with it where they're just disciplined people and they have that. There are some people that have to work at it, but with anything, you can pick it up. It's not a skill that's just for certain people. It's not like math where you're great at math. And then, you know, if you're not great at math, you just can't do it. It's a skill where you can pick up. So I think that that's a great point. Discipline is really important. That's super cool. Yeah. This is awesome. I mean, I didn't know it was just going to be you and me this this whole time. We've we've gone through an hour though, and I still have a billion more questions. Yeah, I'm sorry to the viewers that you just got stuck with me today. I know that's <laughs> tough, but um, you know, Coach O'Neill, who is Devin and I's high school coach, he used to tell me I have a face for radio. So I'm sorry that you guys had to actually <laughs> see me talk. Maybe next time they could turn the camera off. 
<laughs> but I do. I appreciate you letting me come on again. Uh, talking to Phil's will be fun since we train a little bit together. But I guess we'll do that another time. We'll do that another time. And I think, um, yeah, looking to, looking toward next week, we'll figure that out um, to get you on with some of your buddies and, and get it rolling in Eugene with, uh, with, with a nice crew on Monday and Thursday. So tell everybody where they, where they can find you on social media. Yeah. So, um, Devin and a couple of the guys nicknamed me when I was in high school because Bobby Schmurda came out with the song OG Bobby or whatever. And so then they just started calling me OG Bobby. And so my Instagram handle is OG underscore Bobby underscore grant. And, uh, I just never changed it. Cause I think, I think it's funny now. Um, <laughs> and my Twitter handle is, uh, just Bob grant 21. Uh, I, uh, I'm, not like normal people on social media. I like to have fun. I like to really show off my personality. I don't think I'm the type of athlete that tries to show on a separate face than my personality. I think there's some people that like show a certain face on social media, but are different. I'm definitely just myself. So if you enjoy like Ricky Bobby jokes and stuff like that, um, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter and I'll be there. If you hate Texas A&M, don't follow me because that's almost all of what I post a lot of the time. So yeah. If you really hate a it would be a bad follow. That's funny. That's funny. And for World's Greatest, we're uh, World's Greatest Team uh, on on uh, Instagram. World's Greatest without the vowels because someone is still sitting on World's Greatest. Whatever on that. We'll figure that out at one point, some point. And then on, on YouTube, uh, youtube.com backslash World's Greatest. So uh, lots of new content coming out. We're super excited to uh, to share some new content with Devin, uh, definitely, uh, before world championships, maybe we'll see something, uh, dropping a little sooner than that. Um, and then, uh, this whole Brooks, uh, the series with Brooks is called, um, the brains behind the beasts, which, uh, features Danny Mackey, the coach is kind of the central character, but it's all about the road to the world championships. And so we'll, again, that'll be probably on the same, uh, release date is is Devin or around the same time and then in Eugene we'll be shooting more episodes of, of one-on-one episodes Bobby if you're out there we'll be shooting a one-on-one episode with you let's let's get that done yeah have some laughs but uh great show we've we've uh we filled an hour pretty quickly just me and you just chatting it up man so yeah you know I told Bob when, we, when he reached out to me I said unbiased you have a great name and so I think that's why we're such a good match here because we have the same name. Um, and then Coach Henry, if you heard anything that I said tonight or you hear it, I'm sorry that I told a story about you yelling at us after the track meet, but it's funny. We got you just, you know what we should do? I like all the, the, I think you should host one and we bring a bunch of coaches on. So it's like I think I have a better chance of uh, curing cancer than getting Coach Henry to jump on a podcast <laughs> with me. To be totally honest with you, I don't think he would jump right. for that. I we could try. We'll get, we'll get Danny. We'll get Boogie Johnson. Uh, we'll get D2 back on. So that could be an interesting crew to you for you to mix with. Yeah, I know Boogie because he's in Fort Worth. I've, I've missed, messed with him before. That'll be fun. I, I'm not yeah. familiar with the other guys, but I'm sure I could put some questions together for him. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate everyone for watching, and we'll be back on Monday. Awesome. Thanks, guys. See ya.